And I'm going to be going over the big, big 13-game main slate we have here on Friday, June 2. Um, full 13. So we got a lot of arms that we can get to as normal. I've got a little bit of noise coming in on like a Shohei numbers here. We've got a couple of places that are still kind of jacking around. I don't have him projected as a pitcher today necessarily in either projection or ownership, right? And as you can see, that's why the um, standard deviations over here are pretty high. Um, and we got some some weird sort of early day um, ownership figures coming in for guys like a Jack Flaherty, for example. Uh, he, there's naturally a lot of shenanigans go on with Flaherty sometimes when he gets a matchup like this. So um, Clevenger is supposed to be making his start for uh, coming off the DL. Uh, he had like wrist inflammation or whatever for the White Sox today. I don't believe they have officially announced him just yet. Um, but our, all signs of are pointing to him getting activated today. So it should be him for the White Sox. We'll get into that when we get to the game. Um, we do have everything loaded to the site and ready to peruse at your convenience. So feel free to do that. And as always, keep an eye out for updates as we push them throughout the day. So let's just get into the games and talk about some spots. I think we've got a ton of playable spots here tonight. Um, a lot of different arms that we can get to, and they're really kind of spread out, um, and that will should make for some interesting builds. Now, I'm not sure if we're going to need to get down all the way, sub-7,000 to a guy like Jack Flaherty here going for the cards in Pittsburgh. Um, he's 6,800, and... Over his last several starts, I think he's really starting to calm down the variance. The early season troubles, he has been he was getting blasted, and he couldn't find the strike zone, right? Well, that's still a problem. He's still got an aggregate 13.5% walker. It's really to both sides, right? 15% to the lefties here and 12% to the righties. Um, that That's concerning still. And despite the value that he's getting out of his slider and his cutter now, um he's still got to be able to throw strikes, right? And I think that makes him very attackable. Um, those are guys I really like targeting with stacks. Now, that might be a little bit more difficult with Pittsburgh here tonight because this game's in Pittsburgh, of course, right? And Pittsburgh's Pittsburgh, right? They're not all that uh, thrilling to be stacking on a full 13-game slate here, right? Just a 95 WRC plus against righties this season. They'll walk a little bit. So that kind of piques my interest. Um, they'll hit for a little bit of power. These numbers have come off pretty precipitously, I'd say, since their early season um, early season performance, right? But they're still a, a pretty average offense here, and they can get to a guy that has some variance with him, and Flaherty certainly has that, right? Um like I said, I'm, I'm not sure if we need to get all the way down here sub-7,000 tonight because there's so many guys in the mid-range. I think you'd probably rather play. Um, the strikeout rate for Flaherty against the lefties is probably where he's going to give up most of his contact. It's not necessarily hard contact anymore. He's really gotten that under control. But again, it's the walks. And if he starts spraying it, really he's had one, what, two good outings this season uh, where he's popped for north of 20 points. And outside of that, it's either the strikeout stuff has been down. If that hasn't been the case, strikeout stuff is there, but he's given up runs and production all over the place. And the walks have been pretty consistent through most of his outings here. Yeah, he'll he'll pop for, um, you know, just walk with one guy here or there. But for the most part, it's two plus in every single outing. And he's even spiked for... Like in his early season games, he's he walked seven guys, six guys, as recent as four starts ago. He walked four, or excuse me, he walked five Cubs. He walked four against the Dodgers two starts ago. You know, so it's still there, variance-wise for Flaherty, uh, and I think that makes it a tackle. I don't really want to go out of my way to play the Pirates here uh, necessarily, but. They're just middling, right? They're not way, way down the board in terms of value and, and certainly not in ownership. So um, 
I think that makes for an intriguing tournament stack because of this walk figure here. And going after Flaherty is something I, I like to do. Um, as you guys probably remember, I've been stacking against the guy literally every single start the entire season because of this walk rate. I do not trust it. When you put guys on base for free, uh, that gives me opportunity to capitalize on that. And I think the, the Pirates are starting to kind of uh, flatten out. They're not just like down only anymore. Um, in terms of their production. I think they're maybe starting to heat it up a little bit, and I think it, some of them are, are at playable price tags here. Brian Reynolds down to 5,300. I think that's playable. They'll probably have like a Tuki Marcano leading off at some or something like that at shortstop. He's 2,100. So that's a, a decent little value play there. Jack Sawinski, still a hard hit and kind of stat cast um, barrel darling. He's at 3,200. He'll be in the middle of the lineup. And you can play some righties here, too, because the walk rate to the left side is so high. Uh, now, naturally, the, the contact suppression is going to be better against righties for Flaherty. So I'm not going to go out of my way to do it necessarily, but you can always play cut. She's still a fine play. And you can play Connor Joe. He's not going to strike out a lot. And this big ballpark over here in Pittsburgh plays to his skill set a little bit. So uh, he's at 3,400, first and outfield eligibility there couple of guys that will get on base, or if they can get on base, will will run, uh, like a Marcano, like a Jiwon Bay, um, down here, there at the bottom of the lineup. They're all at, at playable price tags. So I think Pittsburgh's an intriguing stat here, stack here going after Flaherty. I'm not super jacked about playing him. Um, Pittsburgh is Pittsburgh, though, so if you land on a 6,800, I think he does have the upside. This price tag does put him in play. Uh, but I'm mostly just off of it. I don't think I, I'm going to need to get that cheap. Rowenzi Contreras on the other side, 6200 for him, same deal. Uh, I like the price tag for him because I think he has upside to to blast through this number on occasion. However, this season, he's really struggling to find it. Slider's been good. Changeup doesn't really throw it a lot, just 4% here, uh, but it's been good as well. However, it's still the four-seamer problem with Rowenzi here. Uh, he, he's gotten the barrel... And, and hard contact numbers kind of under control here. Just an 8% barrel rate. Still giving up a little bit of pop to the lefties, though. 34% with a 283 average allowed, 350 Woba, and a 174 ISO. About a 10.5% walk rate in aggregate as well. So that's kind of a concern also. And a line drive rate really to both sides, 21.5% is a little notable. It's elevated. But really, the number that's going to jump off the page here at us is just a 16.5% strikeout rate and 8.5% to the lefties so far in 105 hitters this year. Uh, that's a really concerning number. When we go after the Cardinals, we really need guys that are going to be able to throw it past them. I don't think Rowenzi is one of those guys. Um, they will go right-handed heavy, of course, because their best hitters, Goldschmidt, Arenado, if you want to call Wilson Contreras one of the best hitters, you know he'll hit from the, from the right side. But they'll probably have Paul DeYoung in there as well. Um, Lars may very well be back tonight. He will almost certainly lead off if he is. Nolan Gorman, I think, is playable at 4,900. This is a high upside spot for pretty much all of these um, all of these righties and lefties for the Cardinals here. And they're going to be a, probably a top five stack in value here for us today. So uh, I think they're very much playable. Hard ballpark to get there with them, however. But uh, this offense we know is very, very potent and we can go after them with a guy that's not going to throw it past them. So uh, no Rowenzi for me, and good. You know, we'll get some exposure to the Cardinals for sure. Probably no Flaherty, uh, I don't think. Maybe some Pittsburgh. Uh, I think targeting that walk rate is very viable. Zach Wheeler on the mound for the Phillies in Washington tonight. 9,200, yeah, let's, uh, let's do it. Um, I think this is fine. I like this ownership figure as well. It's 16% so far. Projection is, is fine for Wheeler. This is a bad strikeout matchup, of course, and that does obviously take me off. I'm always a little weary playing guys against the Nationals because they're, they're a sticky lineup, man. And, um, you know, Wheeler has a little bit of variance with him. However, he showed in his last start against Atlanta that it's still in the tank for him, of course, right? When a full eight inning struck out 12. Um, three hit shutout ball for him so it's still there for Wheeler there's nothing really wrong with him he's got to figure out this curveball though um he's really getting tattooed here with this pitch can't really find it I wish he'd just kind of move a lot of this usage over to the slider uh and perhaps even introduce a, a little bit of a cutter that will give him still a, a 
solid four pitch balance, but he's really struggling with the curveball here. And that's really the only susceptibility, um, you know, that that he's displayed all season. Above average strikeout rates to both sides of the plate. We don't want a single righty against him here. Now, Washington's going to be able to throw some lefties at him, definitely, like a Luis Garcia, Corey Dickerson, Jamer, Kbert, um, even a C.J. Abrams. They'll have five lefties in the lineup here tonight, but I'm not overly worried with Zach Wheeler. I like the price tag, and I certainly – really, it's the, the ownership figure that's kind of jumping off the page for me here. I, I'd like to play some here tonight. This is Washington, and we might have some weather concerns uh, with a few different games here tonight, so keep an eye out for all of that, but – um, you know, weather agnostic, I suppose. There's really nothing wrong and nothing that I can poke holes in here with Zach Wheeler. If anything, we're going to pro probably see a bit more positive regression for him because the strand rate here is still sub-70%. And he's got very high strikeout stuff, right? He's not putting up people on base, very low whip, and a 5.5% walk rate, still throwing plenty of strikes, and a CSW of 29-30% here. So I'm I'm perfectly comfortable getting to a good bit of Wheeler here. And I think we might be able to get some leverage on the field if he comes in at only 15% uh, or so. But I like this play a decent bit. I also like the Phillies targeting JoJo Gray here. 6900 I'm not wild about this price tag, number one. And I think Philly's probably going to be, uh, well, as of right now, they're, they're the most popular stack today. Should they be? Maybe not, because we've got so many offenses that we can get to. But um, you know, they're still very attainable. Like Schwarber, his price has popped a little bit. Uh, he's up to 49 now, but I think this is a fine spot to go after some JoJo. He's, he's moved off of the four-seamer, and he solved the seemingly the hard contact issues that have plagued him over his career so far. He's inducing a lot more soft contact. That's really coming with the sinker-cutter combination. Slider's been pretty damn equitable for him. Same with the, the curveball here, but he's similar to like an Eddie Cabrera. Uh, guys that have good breaking stuff, but are leaving it on the table quite a bit with the fastball. Um, now, he's like I said, th this four-seamer last year was a horrible, horrible pitch, and he was getting tattooed by both righties and lefties. And look at these power numbers allowed this season. I mean, we talked about several times here that JoJo, at cheap price tags and in playable matchups, has been in play. I don't think this is a cheap enough price tag, nor do I think it's a very good matchup. Um Philly is going to be a little bit sticky here to get through. They're just an average offense in terms of creation, but we, of course, know how super dangerous they're going to be. These numbers are going to continue to drift upward with Harper back and getting more at-bats. He's only got about, what, 60 PAs against righties, um, 70 PAs against righties so far this season. So when his numbers really start to, to round into form here uh, throughout the summer, you know, those numbers for the Phillies in aggregate are going to come up as well. Like, Trey Turner's been pretty pretty bad over the last month or so. Uh, so he's been cold. Kyle Schwarber's been really cold as well. These guys aren't going to be this bad this entire season. Um, or it's very unlikely that they will be. So I think this is a fine spot for them to maybe get off the schneid a little bit. Do I want to eat full ownership on them? Uh, maybe not. Um, but I think getting... Exposure to them is perfectly warranted. Probably no JoJo for me here today. And I don't really want any of the Nats either. Uh, even like a Corey Dickerson or something. He's 2300 If you want to get off of some of your Wheeler ownership, I think that's fine to mix him in. Or uh, maybe a short stack Luis Garcia, Dickerson, and a Jamer or something like that. Even even Caber behind the plate has hit a couple bombs recently, um, which Caber is not normally want to do so I think those are, are fine like leverage stacks um, if you want to leverage your own ownership I don't think we're going to need to do it against the field though so mostly just uh, Wheeler and the Phillies there for me okay let's move on Tampa and Boston uh, I like Tyler Glasnow here he's making his second start of the year his first start was against Dodgers and he still struck out what seven in four and two-thirds now he did throw 85 pitches which is very encouraging what we are really going to need to focus on here is Glasnow going a full five and six plus innings. Now, historically, that's never really been a problem with him, but uh, he does have such high strikeout stuff that it does elevate his pitch count sometimes. So uh, we sometimes will only get a 
like five innings out of him. Uh, and this is a difficult matchup, so we'd have to worry about that a little bit. But I think it's a very playable price tag here, and he's probably going to be stretched out to a full 90, maybe even 95 pitches. And that gives us six-inning upside, I think, with Glasnow. And six-inning upside with Glasnow and a 35% strikeout rate, or whatever he's got historically, is very attractive, certainly at sub-10% ownership. I'm not particularly worried about going after Boston with a guy with this kind of whiff stuff. Uh, so I like getting to some glass now here, and I'll definitely have more than the field. Uh, I think this is very much playable. Um, we just have to hope that he, he goes a full six innings. But even in five innings, he's got the upside to strike out 10, even in this kind of you know bad or below average strikeout matchup. right? We've been playing the Red Sox against righties all season. And a lot of these numbers really have been, you know, they've had some good matchups and underperformed quite significantly, especially recently. Um, just at overall, 106 WRC plus, they'll hit for a little bit of hard and for some power uh, and, and don't strike out. So that makes them playable, of course. But, of course, you know, Glasnow is a well above average righty here. So I'd much rather get to him. And I'm not super worried about like getting through an Alex Verdugo, Devers, Turner, and Yoshida at the top of the lineup because once you get to Duran, Casas, Kike, the guys down at the bottom, there's plenty of, of strikeouts there to be had. And again, it's not like Tyler Glasgow is just never going to strike out a Verdugo, Devers, Turner, or Yoshida at the top. Uh, so I think this is very playable for him, and I think this, this is an exploitable figure in ownership so far. Uh, so I like getting to Glasnow, especially if he's going to be fully stretched out. Garrett Whitlock on the other side, um, I don't think we can go here tonight, right? I don't think we're going to need to get this cheap necessarily, right? Uh, and secondly, this is Tampa. I don't play pitchers against Tampa, um, especially if they only have, you know, a sub-20% strikeout rate. And Whitlock here this year, he's been getting blasted by lefty. We got a short sample, so not too much we can take out of this. Um, but some, a little bit of hard contact there. 16% soft. We like this quite a bit higher, no soft contact induced to the right side with a sinker slider here. And to the lefties, throwing this two-seamer and only the two-seamer, doesn't have a cutter, doesn't have a four-seamer. This is a very vulnerable pitch to opposite-handed hitters. And Tampa certainly has a boatload of lefties that they could throw at him tonight. So I think getting to a good bit of Tampa is perfectly warranted as well. They're going to probably pop as a top-five stack for us also. So I'm not really interested in playing Whitlock here tonight. Um, I think we'll probably see a little bit of regression for him. Now, he does have a 5 ERA with expected metrics a little bit lower. This strike one rate at 77%, this is pretty high, uh, pretty high. He's been very efficient. He's not walking anybody, so that's kept him out of a lot of trouble here. But he's still on the barrel so far in an 11% clip, and I think that's a little bit concerning. Not terribly worried about an 88 mile an hour mile an hour average exit velo for him um but this is tampa and we play them pretty much against anybody in baseball and i like going after or with tampa guys that don't have a lot of raw whiff stuff and and whitlock certainly qualifies in that regard at least he has this season um i think that those numbers will probably drift up but overall i just don't go after tampa and despite a Nice price tag. I don't think we'll need to get all the way down here. So just Glasnow and Tampa, probably for me. Um, but you play Boston in, in deep tournament stuff. Like, there's still a little bit of variance with Glasnow because he's just a three-pitch guy, and he can get on the barrel a little bit with the with the slider and the curveball on occasion. Uh, way, way down the board, though. Okay, let's move on to Toronto and the Mets. I think both of these arms are in play. Chris Bassett at 8,100. Verlander certainly at 8,600. Bassett, I think less so. Uh, I generally don't like playing pitchers against the Mets. They're just super hard to get through, even though they're not very impressive. They're not really all that good. They still create a little bit, and they're very sticky up at the top of the lineup. Brandon Nimmo, Frankie Lindor, they've had McDeal in either the two or the three a lot recently. And, of course, Pete Alonso's only got about a 20% strikeout rate himself. Um Starling Marte, whenever he gets on base, he's stealing. So they'll create. They're a little sneaky in that regard. And it makes them hard to get through. Chris Bassett this season, he's had a couple of really good outings. And I think the price tag for him here puts him in play because the Mets have really kind of shit the bed sometimes, right? Um, 
But I'm a little concerned with him. Really, like he's mainlining this two-seamer here as well, throwing a lot of this to lefties, which really is not great. He's not getting any value out of the cutter, which should be a very good pitch, given that his slider is okay. Um, so he's not really neutralizing the, the left-handers all too much. He's given up a lot of average to them. 273 with a 405 Woba and a 300 ISO in a full 130 hitter sample this season. Sub 20% K rate to the lefties. It, the Woba, yeah, it's buoyed a little bit by some walks there at 12% to the lefties as well. But I mean, he's right on the barrel to them. Full 10% in aggregate. And like I said, an elevated walk rate and questionable strikeout rate to the left side. And to the, to the righties as well, just 21%. He's been much better in suppressing power with the curveball and the slider to the righties a little bit. But, um, you know, this sinker-cutter combo here, it's, it's really not giving him a whole lot of equity. He's still using the four-seamer as well. So he throws a lot of junk, not having trouble throwing strike one. It's more strikes two and three and really tailing right back over the middle of the plate. So these are very questionable numbers. I think... Getting to a, a few Mets stacks is warranted attacking this here tonight. Um, two and a half homers per nine, probably a, a noisy figure to the lefties, but uh, elevated hard contact, no soft contact with an elevated line drive rate to the lefties, not noisy at all. He's an 075, 080 ground ball to fly ball to lefties, and as I mentioned, a full 300 ISO, that's a huge number. Uh, over a pretty decent sample here. So I think this is very much attackable with some of these Mets. Nimmo, I like at 45. I think that's playable. McNeil, you can play and mix in. Not a lot of raw upside for him, but he'll even steal some bases as well. Frankie Lindo, of course. And if I'm sacking the Mets, I'm certainly not leaving off Pete Alonso at all. So I think you can get to, like, consider a Danny Vogelbach. Uh, if you're not playing Pete Alonso, you can play some Charlie Marte or Brett Beatty. Sure. Mark Conest shown a little bit of pop in his last several games. He's 2,400. Frankie Alvarez, all the pop in the world behind the plate. Even though, like I said, I don't want to go out of my way to play righties. I think the Mets are a very playable full stack here. Um, I think very intriguing in the mid-range. So I'm probably going to leave Bassett on the shelf personally at 8,100. The price tag does put him in play because the Mets, like I said, they can um, kind of piss down their leg a little bit sometimes. Verlander on the mound for them. 8,600. Yeah, sign me up. Uh, I want to get a lot of this. I love the ownership figure here at 15%. I think the price tag this price tag is just way too cheap. Even in a down strikeout matchup against Toronto, uh, this is still Verlander. Um, Toronto just 20, 21% strikeout rate against righties. Verlander still a well above average righty. And he's had, I think, three... Of his starts have been, I mean, in pretty bad spots, to be honest. His first start against Detroit was a fine spot. He still struck out a K in inning, went five. Didn't give up two runs, but, like, whatever. Um, in his next outing against Cincinnati, he was excellent. He went seven innings, struck out seven, gave up one run. Then he had Tampa, who beat him up pretty good. But that's Tampa. Um, we can kind of excuse him for that. He's a fly ball pitcher, right, with the slider curveball four seamer combination. He's always been a fly baller. It doesn't really have a changeup, so it's understandable that Tampa picked him apart a little bit. Then he had Cleveland in a bad strikeout matchup. He went eight innings, right? So we're not really worried about the depth with Verlander. He did only strike out five against Cleveland, but that's Cleveland. They don't strike out at all. And then he had Colorado at Coors Field. Once again, he's a fly ball pitcher without a changeup at Coors Field. Only struck out two there, but Rockies have been a little bit better against righties this season, and it was at Coors Field. So I think there's a little bit of noise in these overall numbers here for Verlander, and I think the price has gotten a little too carried away to the downside. I love the ownership figure here. Um, and it's, like I said, this is still Verlander. He still has plenty of upside to even pick through the best lineups in baseball. Um, it does make me a little worried every time I go after Toronto, but Verlander still has plenty in the tank strikeout-wise um, to pick through this lineup. And he's got a very good breaking pitch arsenal, and I like going after Toronto with guys that have good breaking arsenals. Uh, and certainly Verlander has always had that with the slider-curveball combo. Um, so I want to get a good bit of this. I think this is very exploitable here, and I think the numbers are not really incorporating kind of the all of the context for Verlander here. Tampa, Cleveland, and Colorado at Coors Field are not great matchups. So, um, yeah, I want to get some of the Mets and some correlated stacks here with Verlander for sure. I'm probably just going to leave Toronto completely on the shelf here today. But 
he's a fly ball pitcher. If you want to go after him, then by all means get to some of these Toronto hitters. Um, but I don't necessarily want to go out of my way to play them. They're still expensive, and there's just other teams I'd rather play. So give me some Verlander in the Mets there. Okay, let's move on to Seattle and Texas. Luis Castillo on the mound. Ah, yeah, yeah, he's probably going to miss the cut for me here today, um, which kind of makes me nervous because every time I fade the guy, he just pops for 40. It makes me look like an idiot. Um, we talked about fading him a little bit in his last start with Pittsburgh. That probably wasn't a very good idea. Um, but it's this changeup. It's still very susceptible here, and when he starts spraying this changeup, uh, he can get on the barrel, and he's got a full aggregate ten percent barrel rate. That is not a very good number for an elite starting pitcher. He throws this changeup too much, and it's it's variant, right? He gives up equity to the field on this pitch, and when it's bad, it can be really really bad. He still gives up a full thirty seven percent aggregate hard contact to both sides of the plate, thirty five percent to the lefties, thirty nine percent to the righties. Yeah, he's got the strikeout stuff. Um, and he keeps himself really out of a lot of trouble because he doesn't walk people. He throws strikes. So even when this changeup is below his standards, he can still be very good uh, in keeping the baseball in the yard. However, when it it when he starts spraying a little bit, um, then he can get onto the barrel and, and give up a lot of really, really loud contact. And... Sure, you can go after Pittsburgh with Luis Castillo. Uh, but do you really want to do that with Texas? I mean, I probably don't, and I'd rather just play Zach Wheeler, to be honest. So uh, even in a worse strikeout matchup, like I, I'd much rather just play Wheeler. I trust him more. I trust his arsenal in aggregate a little bit more. That said, it does make Luis Castillo a fantastic tournament play here. However, look at this 15% ownership. I mean, I'd much rather just drop down to Verlander at the same ownership figure or drop down to Glasnow at half of this number, um, something like that, rather than you know try and eat a full 17% or whatever. I mean, you're getting the same ownership number on Wheeler. So just I would much rather play that because Texas is a far, far better lineup compared to Pittsburgh, and they are still super dangerous, right? Pittsburgh against righties only creating at, what, an 85 clip or, or something. Um, Texas, on the other hand, at a full 113 clip. So... Despite the elevated strikeout rate against righties, and as I said, that does keep Luis Castillo in play at 9,400 here, the elevated ownership kind of takes me off. I don't like going after Texas here. This is a very dangerous list. Look at all this hard contact, 36% in aggregate for the team, and Corey Seager really hasn't missed a beat. So um, that makes it very hard. they got a lot of very good fastball hitters over here and guys that can capitalize on mistakes. At the top of the lineup, in particular, Semi and Seager, Nate Lowe, Adelise Garcia. Josh Young, good fastball hitter as well. So, um, And Robbie Grossman, he's been excellent this season. Leody Tavares, he's got popped down at the bottom. Hard lineup to get through here. So, Luis Castillo, I'm probably going to leave him on the shelf. But, um, you know, it makes me nervous. Don't get me wrong when I'm fading a, a 30% aggregate strikeout rate. Pretty much always. John Gray, I think we can play him on the other side. Um I like attacking Seattle, and I think John Gray, at least in his last four starts, he's really displayed that he's got this slider uh, changeup combination figured out. Four-seamer has been much better as well, and this was actually the matchup that really got him going. He was 7,700 against Seattle about a month ago on May 8th, and he went seven and struck out eight, just gave up one run, and that really start, got him going, and in his... Most recent three starts after that, eight innings, five innings against Colorado when he struck out six. He was still fine there. Seven innings against Baltimore, struck out eight. And then we had the outing against Oakland where he was good as well, went eight and struck out five. Uh, so I think John Gray has, has really kind of balanced out the bad changeup value that he was seeing earlier in the season and really spiking the slider value here. Full four outs above average nearly. That's a damn good figure. I like going after Seattle with, with upside righties at playable price tags, and I think John Gray qualifies in that regard here at uh, at 9% ownership and a 30 value score here. This is a good projection for somebody in the mid-7Ks. I think this is very playable. Now, if we're looking for negative regression for John, um, well, it's probably going to come in the strand right here. Full 86%, that's concerning because he does only display a 20% strikeout rate so far. It's not walks. 
so he's not going to put a lot of people on base for free or anything like that. It'll be through average, and then, you know, he'll just start spraying the change or spiking the slider or whatever, not spotting the four-seamer, and then, you know, things can get out of hand real quickly with John. Um, I don't really want to go out of my way to play any anybody against him in this particular matchup. You could always play Julio. You can always play Kelnick in a good spot. Uh, yeah, and you can always play Cal Raleigh against a righty. 4,600. I think those. that's probably the stack I'd play, but everybody else I'm I'm not super interested in. I think this is a very winnable matchup for John Gray here. It is the second time he's seeing Seattle, uh, as I mentioned, so I'd probably side with the offense in general in most of those scenarios, uh, but I do like the changes here that John Gray's displaying over his last several starts, uh, and I love the price tag and the ownership here. So yeah, sign me up for some John Gray. We'll see how much we land on, but uh, I like that play. Okay, let's move on. Angels and Houston. Both of these arms obviously in play. This is Shohei, 10-7. Uh, this is very playable. If you can make this happen price-wise, uh, yeah, go nuts. I think there's attackable offenses in the mid-range that are much cheaper that I don't have a problem getting up to this if you can make this happen. You still got a 35% aggregate strikeout rate to both sides of the plate. The one thing with Shohei this season, he's got an 11% walk rate. Like, what is going on here? He's not. He's off the barrel. And he's still getting ground balls, so he's and he's got a 35% K rate. So with this 15% swinging strike rate, CSW over 33%, I'm not super concerned about an 11% walk rate with Shohei. Um, so I think that's still playable, but this is a notable figure. Everything else, though, is pretty okay. He's got a high strain rate himself, but that's due to the whiff stuff and the ground ball stuff. Even though he's putting some guys on base for free, he's still getting out of these innings because he could throw it past people. Um, so I'm not super worried about that elevated walk rate and really anything north of 9 and 10%. That makes me balk um, pretty hard usually. But this is Shohei, and I'm not super concerned. I don't really want to play any of the Astros, to be quite honest. Uh, Shohei is giving up a little bit more hard contact and a little bit more production to the left side, but it's still just a 162 average to them with a 260 Woba, like a 162 ISO, like, okay, he's still got a 33% strikeout rate. I don't really care. So I don't want to play any of the righties. He's elite against the right side, sub 150 average allow in a buck 10 ISO with a 37% K rate there. So no thanks on the, on the Astros here, even though their strikeout rate is going to continue to drop. It's down under 23% here, and we'll see the creation creep up now that they've got Altuve stabilizing the lineup at the top here. Um, but just a 135 ISO still, so they're not going to hit for a lot of power, certainly not in this particular matchup, and I don't want to play Jordan. You can always play Jordan, don't get me wrong, but do you want to play Kyle Tucker and Jordan at their normal price tags of 52 and 5,700 in a way, way below average matchup against Shohei? I don't particularly, so it's just a price tag thing. If this ownership persists, I think we get some noise here, as we talked about in the opening. Uh, it'll probably come up. Um, but if this ownership hovers around 15%, I think this is a very exploitable figure here today. I think Shohei's got you know, 30 and 35 point upside on DK tonight. Um, even in a you know, traditionally difficult matchup, I think that's perfectly fine. Framber as well at 10-1. Here's where all the ownership's definitely going to go. And if this, like I said, if this delta persists, uh, I, I think this makes Shohei a fantastic tournament play. Um, he's projecting, you know, point, two points lower, whatever. But we've got a very high standard deviation and half a standard deviation there. So once we get the Shohei numbers to flesh out throughout the rest of the day, we'll see where they, they end up, uh, and we'll push those to the side, of course. I think that will probably make him a better tournament play than Framber, even though I really like playing Framber in tournaments. Like, he's got some question marks this season. This changeup is awful this year. And this has really been one of his moneymaker pitches. Same thing with the slider, keeping him down in the strike zone. Of course, he's getting a lot of value out of the two-seamer, as he normally does. But this changeup, he's given up a lot of hard contact to the righties, man. He's right in the middle of the plate with this. And it's only a five-mile-an-hour velo delta, as we talked about with Framber. So he's got to get this figured out. And despite the super impressive ground ball stuff and the very high strikeout stuff himself... Hard contact, we need to start to balk at, and 40% is 40% with a bad off-speed pitch here that he is literally just piping. Uh, I think this ISO number is probably going to end up coming up, and you could very well see some regression for Framber, so I'm not sure I want to eat a full 30% on him today. I'd rather 
play Shohei. If I get up this high, we'll get to another couple of guys later um, in the upper 9K that I think is a better play than probably both of these guys, to be honest. In any case, uh, they're still both in play because they have incredibly high upside, and these are winnable matchups for them. I'd much rather side with the Angels on offense if I had to, uh, but I don't play guys against Fram. I don't stack against him. This ground ball to fly ball ratio at over 3-1 to one is insanely difficult to get through, um, and he can't play one of their best hitters in a stack tonight. So it makes Trout easier to, to play, right, because every other one of these guys is under 4,000 outside of Drury, who is 41. Um, so that's fine if you want to play some kind of leverage pieces, like little short stacks, Taylor Ward, Mike Trout, maybe a Renhifo or something like that, or a Hunter Renfro, uh, who could maybe get to baseball in the air here a little bit. I think that's okay, but I'm not going to go out of my way to do it. Just going to side with pitching for the most part here uh, in Houston tonight. Cleveland and Minnesota, Aaron Savali is, is back. Um, he was dealing with an oblique. He's been out for about a month or two months even. Um, I'm not really concerned about the injury necessarily. I'm more concerned with the price tag and generally the, the lack of raw whiff stuff that, that Savali has. Um, this is just this season's numbers. He only got two starts before he got hurt. and But, but typically he's a, a sub-20% strikeout guy himself. So um, when we go after the Twins, we really like high strikeout guys because they'll whiff, man. This is the highest strikeout rate split adjusted on the slate today at 26%. This is a big, big number. These guys whiff because they've still got freaking Joey Gallo in the lineup somehow. Um, they did just activate Georgie Polanco, who will strike out far less than an Eddie Julian, who they optioned. So he won't be in there tonight. Royce Lewis, they'll probably have up at the top. We'll see what they want to do with a um, a Carlos Correa. Uh, he may they, they may have put him on the DL. I'm checking right now he's not on the dl but uh yeah he's still dealing with the the plantar fasciitis a little bit so they'll probably have royce lewis up at the top of the lineup at shortstop makes them a little bit easier to stack if you want to do that and i think that's okay um i generally don't like going after savali because i think he's a pretty good arm he sequences well he's got a really good cutter so it's um very hard to get there with opposite handed hitters against savali because he induces a good bit of soft contact Generally, I think it's okay um, playing Savali at a cheap price tag in a good matchup. This is an okay matchup. Not super wild about the price tag. Um, I'm not concerned about the injury and being hurt or anything like that still. It was just an oblique. And those are injuries that uh, teams typically are very careful with. Um, and he's been fine in his rehab outing. So they, they rehab them very conservatively and make sure. Because there's a lot of moving parts with the obliques, right? So they make sure that you're good to go with an oblique. Like Tyler Glasnow was out with an oblique as well, and he was down for two months also. You know, So um, not super concerned that he's still hurt. It wasn't an arm injury or anything. So if he were 7,000, I think that'd make him a very intriguing tournament play. And at 1.5% ownership, he's still an intriguing tournament play because the Twins are bad, man. Um, so you could consider landing on it. I'm not going to go out of my way to do this, though. 8,400 on the mound. I'd rather play ba Bailey over, to be honest. Um, even against Cleveland, Cleveland is far worse. 77 WRC plus, no power whatsoever. Even though they put up a couple crooked numbers over the last week, they still have real no upside collectively. Even though Josh Naylor really exploded, he's dealing with a little bit of a sore wrist. Josie Ramirez still not hitting the baseball over the wall. Um, and what they had a. a, a Gabriel Arias and, and Andres Jimenez have some good days or something, you know, but that's pretty much it. Um, overall, they're a very low upside offense, and I think Bailey Ober can pick through them and and last here. If you land on something here in the mid-8K range on the mound, I think this is a playable price tag for him. This is a hard strikeout matchup, of course, and he's got lower strikeout numbers to the left side. They're going to platoon pretty heavily here still. Um, so I'm not going to go out of my way to do this with Ober. We like him against generally pretty right-handed heavy lineups. You've got to be careful, though. He's given up 47% hard contact to the right side of the plate. This is a a, a pretty uh, concerning sample size here so far, and a total of 150 hitters. Yeah, it's short still, 70 hitters, but 47% still 47%. It's going to come down uh, because he does have whiff stuff, and that kind of number just can't real, really persist. But I'm not going out of my way to play Cleveland here. I'd like to get to a little bit of Bailey over if I can because I think there's some upside for him to pop for 25 and 30, go a full seven innings here, strike out six. 
something like that tonight uh, against Cleveland. I think that's very playable if you land on it. But once again, not super interested in this game overall. Um, if you want to target some home run hitters from Minnesota, though, I think that's probably okay. Okay, let's move on. Detroit and Chicago. Uh, the White Sox, that is. Uh, Reese Olsen making his Major League debut. Um, not super impressive numbers down in here in the minors. He's only got he's got 10 full starts, right? And he's only gone uh, 36 and two-thirds innings. So doesn't appear to be, like... It's not just a, a mixture of bullpen work down there. It's 36 and two-thirds starter innings. So he's only going uh, three and two-thirds every start here. So I think that takes him totally out of play. Um, even though, like, he might have some decent ground ball stuff, he's got a 13.5% swing strike rate. He's got about a one-and-a-half to one ground ball to fly ball ratio, give or take, and a 27% K rate. However, he does have a 12.5% walk rate. The StatCast numbers for him so far are pretty decent. 87 mile an hour average exit philo. That's a pretty good number. And just a 31% StatCast hard hit rate. Also a very good number. Um, but that's AAA, and that's the upper minors. He still has a 6.4 ERA with a 470 XFIP. So uh, really not interested in going after the White Sox with him here. Could probably hope to get to some White Sox stacks. They're kind of down the down the board a little bit, and I'm not really sure why. Um, this guy's got some real attackable numbers here, I think. And even though they're right-handed heavy, the White Sox, they're they're healthy now. This is their healthy lineup. Tim Anderson, Luis Robert, Loy Jimenez, Juan Moncada, all back and all healthy. Um, still not a lot of raw upside for them, so it's going to take a little bit of time for these numbers to start to climb. But they're still going to strike out below average here, or above average, however you want to look at it, at just 22 23%. Not making enough hard contact just yet, but these guys, as soon as they start to round into form, these numbers should climb. However, we did expect that all of last season, and they were bad all of last season to the same kind of 82 WRC plus clip here against right-handers. So i um, not sure I want to go out of my way to get some White Sox, but I think this is very playable. And if they're, not, if they're going to be completely ignored here, I don't like the only guy that's over 5,000 is Luis Robert. He's at 5,300. Everybody else, 4,600 or less. And 4,600, that's Tim Anderson. You know, uh, he's a perfectly fine shortstop play at the top of the lineup here tonight. So I think playing some of the White Sox is okay. And you can play some correlated stacks as well with Mike Clevenger on the mound, 6,600. I generally don't like playing Clev anymore. Um, however, this is Detroit. And they're terrible, right? 84 WRC plus for them, 9% walk rate, whatever. But they strike out, you know, at an above average clip here, 23%. They're attackable also. 30% hard contact, whatever, but no power from them either. So pretty similar offenses here overall. Um, but I think Clev, it, it, he's certainly a more established major league arm. And I think this price tag is attackable and playable. If you get down here to 6,600, and you get to, I don't know, Shohei on the mound or something, and another expensive secondary stack. I think full White Sox stacks are very much in play. Getting to pretty much one through nine here, uh, I don't like playing as Monty Grandal at 3,900 generally, but this is a a young kid making his Major League debut, and he's not going to go all that deep into the game. So I think going after him and the Detroit bullpen is very much warranted here. Um, I think he's a pretty decent off the board stack. We don't really have to deal with weather necessarily in Chicago tonight. It doesn't look like, uh, and it's warm there. So I think this is very playable pretty much uh, all across the board here with Clevenger, even with a depressed strikeout rate, he's coming. You just had like an inflamed wrist or something. Um, but he's been fine. You know, the, the, the slider value is, is good here. He's throwing a lot of junk, not getting a lot of value out of the cutter. Um, but he's popped for a, a score or two here, and I think at a, a 6,600, I think it's in play. I don't think we need to get all the way down here, and certainly if you full stack the White Sox, you're probably not even going to need 6,600 on the mound to play a correlated stack. But it's in play, I think, if you if you land on something like that. Um, this is Detroit, and they're still pretty bad. So pretty much the White Sox just exclusively here. But since Clevenger does pitch to a lot of contact, you could play Zach McKinstry, Akil Badu on the other side. Torque at 2600 that's a pretty damn good price. I don't want to play 44 for Javi Baez. Rather play Tim Anderson at 46 on the other side. Um, 
But like a Nick Maton at 2,200 second base, I mean, that's not a bad play necessarily, even though he strikes out a crap load. Okay, let's move on. Colorado and Kansas City. I really like offense here. Um, of course, Kansas City. We'll get to them in a sec. 5,500 on the mound for Chase Anderson. I don't think we could play this. Um, he's had three full starts. He's not striking out anybody, though. And that's really kind of concerning. Is is four-seamer, two-seamer, cutter make? This is just a soft contact arsenal here, and it's really showing out. Full 24% in aggregate so far in the 80 hitters that he's seen this season. This is a mix between Colorado and, what, he had one appearance with Tampa, I think. Um, he may have been somewhere else, maybe Atlanta or something like that as, as well. In any case, do, inducing a lot of soft contact here. That's mostly the cutter changeup, neutralizing all of the left-handed power. He's always had a very good change. His susceptibility historically has been to the righties. Now, he'll probably still have that a little bit, but throwing he's going to throw the cutter to right-handers here as well. Um, that'll tail over the barrel a little bit sometimes, so that'll give him some susceptibility to the righties still. But overall, it's been a pretty equitable arsenal so far. Um, that doesn't mean we're not going to play a good bit of the Royals. They're too cheap for this type of contact matchup. Vinny Pascantino, he's probably going to be tops in value. One of the best plays of the day here. Same with Nick Prado today. Uh, very cheap, 3000 3600 for Prado and Vinny. Salvi, of course, at 5200 you could play him. Bobby Witt at 55 he's still very much playable. And everybody else is under 3500 So, yeah, sign me up for the Royals, but you're not fooling anybody. They're going to be very, very popular. Uh, so I think we could pivot, and one of the teams I think we could pivot to is Colorado on the other side. They're not going to be near as popular. And I think this is probably a better batted ball matchup. Jordan Lyles, he just I think he's about cooked here. Uh, he's he's getting blasted by both sides, giving up not so much in average to lefties, but look at this, 348 Woba, that's a pretty big number. 275 ISO is a huge number. 19% strikeout rate to the lefties, 11% walk rate, 37.5% hard contact. And it's not like this is a small sample. We got a full 32 innings on him this year. He's given up 2.3 homers per nine to lefties, and he's given up 2.4 to the righties as well. More average there, 276 to the righties, 381 Woba, but a half the strikeout rate. So that's all coming in contact, 309 ISO to them as well. So I think the Rockies here uh, are a pretty formidable stack, if I'm being quite honest. I'm not sure I want to pay or play a guy like a Harold Castro or anything, but it'll probably be the six hole because... Bud Black is pretty stubborn uh, with playing Harold Castro in the six hole. He makes contact, um, so that makes him playable in stacks. He's got dual eligibility. Yeah, go ahead. But Blackman is back off the bereavement list. Jerry Profars, he's got like a 40-game on base streak or something like that. Not a lot of raw power upside from Jerry, but he's at a playable 3,900. He's getting on base. That's really all we can we can ask for. Randall Grichik's been fine this season. They'll probably have, probably have him at the top of the lineup with Chris Bryant and C.J. Crone both still out. But I think Ryan McMahon is one of the best third base plays of the day. He'll be popular for sure, but 4600 I think he's underpriced in this particular matchup. Really starting to see the baseball, and he's been excellent over the last week. Elias Diaz, you got a balk at 5000 for him, but he's at 315 and not a lot of power, just six jacks this season, but he's got a push in 900 OPS. I think he's a pretty damn playable catcher piece, if I'm being honest. And the young guys, Zeke Tovar, Nolan Jones, Brenton Doyle, they will almost certainly be in the lineup tonight with all those those other guys hurt, Chris Bryant and C.J. Crone. So, yeah, sign me up for a, a lot of the Rockies here. I think this is one of the few spots you can get pretty jacked about playing them outside of Coors Field. And you're going to get them kind of off the board in ownership. So I think they're very playable, full stack, short stacks. Uh, we can go after Jordan Lyles 100% with everybody. Uh, so I, I like this. Um, they're a pretty low upside offense, still generally. Don't hit the ball over the wall a whole hell of a lot. And the ISO number is going to be buoyed here by playing and hitting a lot for a lot of extra bases at Coors Field. But it's still a 90 WRC plus, full 270 average, and a 22% strikeout rate against righties this season, 33% hard nearly. This is not the same Rockies. I say this every day when they when they get a righty, and this is a very attackable right-hander here. So I think it's a, a super playable Rocky spot. Um, Kansas City for sure, and probably no pitching. I don't think we need to get that cheap, and I don't think the plays are that good. So offense only there, I think. Okay, Atlanta and Arizona. Charlie Morton on the mound, 7,800 here. Ugh. I like this price for Charlie. Um, 
I think the projection is fine for him. There's probably some guys that we could get to a little bit cheaper that are projecting a little bit better. But I like the ownership as well. However, this is a bad matchup, man. Uh, he's got some susceptibility to left-hander still. Despite a 28% strikeout rate to them, he's walking 11% of them. He's given up a 279 average with a 358 Woba and a 189 ISO to them. 39% hard contact still. I'm really still waiting for this curveball to fall off a cliff, so to speak, uh, in one of these starts, and every other one of his pitches is awful. He's not getting any value anywhere. It's a changeup that's really his best of the of the other four that he's throwing, and that's just a break-even, and it'll be a variant pitch. So whenever Charlie doesn't have this curveball going, he's going to get blasted, and he's going to give up a real crooked number soon. Um, I usually don't like going after Arizona. This is a very hard lineup to get through. They only strike out with righties, at least. Against righties, 19% of the time, 105 WRC+, plus. it's because they don't hit for a lot of average, but 260 is a pretty decent and respectable figure over this 1,500 PA sample here. They'll hit for some hard contact and for a little bit of power. They've got some guys that will run and steal bases. Paven Smith, they've been leading him off recently, and they, they've done this over the last couple of seasons. When he starts seeing the baseball, uh, he becomes a damn good play in the outfield. They're very cheap leading off for them. Cattell Marte, you can always play pretty much against everybody. Corbin Carroll, you can do the same. He's going to steal a lot of bases. He gets on. He will run. It doesn't matter who it, who's on the mound. Um, this is one of the fastest guys in baseball, so he'll, he'll still steal two bags for you. Uh, and same thing with, like, a Jake McCarthy. If he can get on base, he's been moving a lot recently, but Jerry Perdomo and uh, it, even a Cattell Marte on occasion will swipe a bag. So I think he's a very playable, kind of off the board a little bit, stack for Arizona going after some Charlie. There's variance here, and I think he's going to get blown apart sometime soon. I don't know when it's going to be. And eventually I'll be right, so, like, yeehaw. Um but this hard contact number is way too high. I know there's ground balls and, and all that kind of jazz, but there's some pretty significant weakness here, and I think this strand rate is going to crater eventually. He's walking too many guys. 9% is not a horrible number, but it's 9%. And this hard contact number, really to both sides, giving up 33% to the righties as well. Uh, he's going to get picked apart eventually, and I think Arizona is a very sneaky team here tonight. Um, so I like getting to them at a... Some pretty playable price tags, and I think you can correlate with Merrill Kelly for sure. Look at the strikeout number from Merrill Kelly this season, 27.5%. It's really to both sides. It's not like it's like 40% to the righties or whatever in a small sample. He's seen 250 hitters. He's got a 27.5% K rate this year. That's out of control, like insane. It's about seven ticks higher for Merrill this season than he's had really in the last several years. Um, he's getting a lot of value out of this changeup cutter combination. Two seamers been very good. He's sequencing great. I love playing this guy when he is completely off the board. And we're we're getting him sub five percent ownership here. I'm not super thrilled about the price tag necessarily, but I don't really care. I'll play him well above nine thousand if he's off the board in an okay matchup. And I think this is a pretty good matchup for him. Now, he's walking a lot of righties here, so that could present a problem for him. But he's still getting a, a good few ground balls. He's given up some hard contact. So similar to Charlie Morton, you can attack that and attack these numbers because there will likely be some regression. He does have a 280 ERA with expected metrics about a run higher. 191 average allowed, probably a bit noisy. So you're def I don't have them in the sheet here, but you're going to see the expected metrics, the XBA, the XWOBA, and the XI, so a little bit higher for Merrill compared to his realized numbers for sure. But I'm very attracted to this strikeout rate here against Atlanta in particular. We saw what like Zach Wheeler did to them, uh, for example. We like going after high upside strikeout guys going after Atlanta, because they, they whiff, man. They whiff a crap load. And they're just, against right-handers, just an average, well below average at a 98 WRC plus here in creation against right-handers. They'll hit for pop and hard contact, of course, but they're going to strike out. So I think at very low ownership, Merrill Kelly is absolutely in play here. Um, not sure how much I'll end up landing on it, because there's probably other guys I think I'd prefer to get to. I think the price tag is maybe a little bit high, and this hard contact number, really to both sides, 38% is worrisome for sure. Um, 
So I think everybody is pretty much in play here. Charlie's in play because of the whiff stuff uh, against lefties. Merrill's in play because of the whiff stuff against both sides. And I think the Braves, of course, you can always play them against everybody. And Arizona, I think you can target Charlie here. So this is a very interesting tournament game. Uh, I think all sides are, are really in play there. Okay, Chicago and San Diego, let's move on. Um, Jamison Tyon on the mound, 5,400. I don't think I could do this yet. Now, this is the seasonal price low for him, but it's it's warranted. He has been dreadful. The suppression is not there. He's really giving it up. I know the XERA and the XFIP are markedly lower for Tyon, but he's giving up production literally every single start here. He's on the barrel. He's not walking people. It's mostly just average, right? 351 and a 286 to lefties and righties, respectively, in the average allowed. Walks to lefties at 15%. Yeah, we had a small sample for Tyon because he was hurt. Um, but, I mean, they definitely brought him back too early, and he's not really found it just yet. So I think I'm going to leave him on the shelf. I don't think you need to get all the way down here to 5,400, as I've said a couple of times. But this barrel rate's very attackable. You can go after him with some Padres here if you want to make that happen. Now the three guys up at the top that you are that you really want to play, Tati, Soto, Bogarts, they're expensive, 6, 55, and 51, but Bogart's heating up a little bit more. I think he's playable uh, for sure. And Soto at 55, I think he's a playable price tag. And you can always play Tatis, of course. Cronenworth at 43, that's fine. Dual eligibility up top. Uh, Rugi Odor has been a little bit better recently. And everybody down at the bottom half of the lineup, they're all super cheap. They've got Babe Sanchez catching for him now um, since Austin Nola has been awful and whoever, who, who else have they had? Uh, Brett Sullivan, maybe, I think, from the left side. Um, but their catcher production has been, dre like, just totally dreadful all season. So they got him down here. He's at a playable 3,300. Carpenter as well at 3,000 flat. I still don't play Trent Grisham. He's still terrible. Um, but Tyon's not necessarily going to blow by him here. I think that probably puts him in play in tournament stacks, deep tournament stacks only. Um Hassan Kim, still a playable contact piece. So I think pretty much every one of the Padres here is in play, and they're kind of middling so far in value and in ownership. So, uh, yeah, sign me up. We can go after Tyon. I think that's fine. Michael Walk on the mound, I think he's in play as well at 7,400. Uh, he's got a very good changeup, man, and, and the value out of the change is really spiked in the last several outings for him, getting a lot more. He doesn't walk people. He stays off the barrel. Now, he's got... Really kind of susceptible fly ball numbers here uh, and giving up some hard contact a little bit to the righties. He'll throw this righty righty change though, and that keeps them, that neutralizes good power, a lot of power because it's a really good pitch. He throws the cutter a bit too much to the right handers. I'd, I'd like him to stop doing that because that's a bad pitch to same handed hitters. It tails over the barrel. So we don't want that, but everything else has been pretty serviceable for him. And at 7,400, I think that puts him in play. I'm not jacked about 15% ownership here. I think we could pivot uh, in this range, uh, but I think it's, it's fine. And he's projecting very well for somebody in the mid 7Ks and above 30 and even above 32, pushing 33 in the value score. That's a pretty damn good number for him. So I think this is fine going after the Cubs here. Um, they're just an average offense. If you want to stack them, yeah, there's some variance with, with Michael Walker. So you can go after that, get a little bit of leverage on the field. Don't think that's bad. But overall, just a pretty underwhelming and, and stone average offense. Average K rate, above average walk rate, sure. But average power, below average in hard contact, average WOBA, average OPS, etc., etc., etc. They hit too many ground balls. So uh, I think that puts Waka in play here. Um, kind of worried a little bit about the line drive rate to lefties in particular. So if you want to play maybe like an Ian Happ or Mike Talkman, Matt Mervis maybe. We'll see if Miles down at the bottom of the list. We'll see what they want to do. They may leave him off. I mean, who knows? Uh, put Nico in like the two or something. I think that a lefty piece here or there is okay, but that's really dangerous because this changeup is so good. So would probably just side with Walk and the Padres here. Um, I think the ownership is fine. Probably more of a cash play, I think, for Waka, but I think he's got 25 in the tank, definitely. Okay, let's move on. Yankees and the Dodgers. Uh, Luis Severino making his, what, second start of the season, I believe. Um, their third start. He was good in his first two outings, right? Four and two-thirds against Cincy. Went, uh, gave up a run, struck out five. Six and two-thirds against San Diego. Gave up one, struck out five. So that's encouraging. However, this is the Dodgers, and I don't play pitchers against the Dodgers unless they have, like, outsized whiff stuff. 
Um, and I'm still in kind of wait and see mode with Seve coming back from the lat strain. So I, I'm not going to go after the Dodgers here tonight. The price tag certainly puts him in play, right? This is a 10K arm, or was last season at at times, usually in the mid 9Ks or so. Uh, so he's well underpriced for his historical upside. Don't get, you know, let's not get that confused. But uh, this is the Dodgers in probably the second worst or maybe even the worst matchup in baseball for a right-hander. 116 WRC plus against righties for the Dodgers, 11% walk rate. 23% strikeout rate, yeah, whatever, but a 211 ISO and 35.5% hard contact with line drives and fly balls. So uh, no thanks for Seve. Clayton Kershaw on the other side. Now the Yankees are getting everybody back tonight. Rizzo will start tonight. He doesn't strike out a lot against lefties or righties. But they will also have Stanton back and Donaldson too. So this is the healthy Yankee lineup. It's going to make it hard for me to get this type of ownership on Kershaw. Now, I love Kershaw, and we can really give him a break for his last three uh, his last three starts. He's, two of them were just, you know, kind of pretty bad matchups. And, of course, he's been dealing with the death of his mother. So we don't really want to – I mean, there's nothing fundamentally wrong here with Kershaw. Even with those three starts when he's given up four runs, four runs, and two runs, strikeout stuff is still there, seven, six, and six, right? Uh, it's just the depth – and probably not fully there uh, mentally on the mound. So he's, you know, missed with some pitches and, and given up a little bit of production. Uh, I think this is a, it might actually increase their, you know, the strikeout upside for Kershaw tonight. It is a very playable 9,000. He's been one of the best arms in baseball all season. I think we can give him a break for his last three subpar outings for sure. So I've got no problem getting to Kershaw. Am I going to get to it? Like, it's the ownership figure here that really kind of makes me balk a little bit. Um, but the projection, like, he's underpriced, certainly for the upside, because with Stanton and Donaldson back, like, these guys strike out a truckload. So I think it's probably going to increase the strikeout upside for, for Kershaw here tonight. And we're waiting for him to um, kind of start to round back into form a little bit. So I think it's playable. Do I want to eat 25% of my teams on it? I mean, there's a lot of arms we can get to. Probably not, but there's nothing wrong fundamentally here. Every every single number that you look at with Kershaw uh, is is excellent this season. Um, you know, outside of like break-even four-seamer value, that's never really been his money-making pitch. It's the breaking stuff that's always been there for him. So um, nothing wrong fundamentally, and I think this is probably a, a, an elevated upside matchup for him now that they're getting all their strikeout bats back in the lineup tonight. So I think he's playable. If you want to, however, still target some, you know, the healthy Yankee lineup against a lefty that has been struggling a little bit um, and may not be totally fixed um, just yet, then yeah, by all means, go ahead, play, play all of them. Like, like I said, it, Rizzo doesn't strike out. You can play him. He's 5,000 though. I'm not going out of my way to play lefty against... Kershaw at that price tag, but you can always play Judge. You can play Glaber against every lefty in baseball. That's fine. He's 52, though. So, like, these guys are expensive, and I don't really want to go out of my way to play the Yankees, but Kershaw, if he gets 25% ownership, I think a Yankees leverage stack here or there is probably pretty warranted. Stanton is still 51, right? Uh, Donaldson, 31. DJ is still cheap at 33, whatever. Not playing IKF on a 13-game slate. Probably not going to get to Volpe on a 13-game slate, but you know, in order to full stack the Yankees, you might have to play some of these guys down at the bottom. So um, I don't think it's totally off the board here, but I'd almost certainly just side with Kershaw because the Yankees, well, this Yankees lineup, they're gonna, still going to strike out a lot. Uh, Dodgers on the other side. Do I want to go out of my way and target Seve? Probably not. I respect his uh, his arsenal and, and his upside also. But this is the Dodgers, so if they're similar to Atlanta, like you pretty much need to have exposure to these guys every single night because of what they can do. And it's certainly when they are off the board a little bit, and they definitely are tonight. Uh, I don't want to go out of my way to stack against Severino, but for the same reason that I don't want to go out of my way to stack against Kershaw, I mean, Dodgers are a far better lineup. So yeah, sign me up with some of these guys. We can get to him. Muncie, 51, that's fine. Freddie at 54, it's fine. Will Smith, 57, and Mookie at 59, not great, right? But Jason Hayward, David Peralta, some of the guys down at the bottom of the lineup uh, are fine to mix in as well. So uh, let's move on to the last game of the night. 
Baltimore and San Francisco. Dean Kramer on the mound, 6,700 for Dean. Um, I, ugh, ugh. I, I don't think we need to get this cheap, as I've said like 17 times already. Um, I think this is an okay spot for him, though. Like, I generally don't like playing Dean because he doesn't strike anybody out, pitches to a lot of hard contact to the lefties, right? His cutter-slider combination has really not been good. He's not getting whiffs to righties with the slider. He's not getting whiffs or ground balls, really, to lefties. 0.85 ground ball to fly ball ratio to the left side of the plate. He's given up a 42.5% hard contact rate to him. I think that makes the Giants for an intriguing, super deep tournament stack and absolutely a late slate stack. Um, on a 13-gamer, I it, I still find it hard to be playing despite, you know, improved dimensions of the ballpark and, you know, whatever. Uh, I still find it hard to be playing San Francisco um, on full slates in San Francisco. Like, it's 55 degrees. It just suppresses so much power at night there. But these guys are at very playable price tags. I think if you mix in a short stack uh, against Dean here and targeting this very high hard contact rate, I think it's pretty warranted. 336 average allowed to lefties, 384 Woba. It's not walks, right? It's just average in contact, 160 ISO here, 17% strikeout rate. No soft contact, 9% soft contact rate is kind of insane. Um, so he's a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy. You can play a couple of these righties too. If you want to mix in JD Davis, Mitch Handiger, they're playable price tags also. So I don't think this is a horrible stack. It's down the list for sure. Um, for me, but not necessarily in value. And that's mostly because they're, they're also cheap. So, um, Dean is, is definitely attackable, but since the Giants strike out so much, I think and this is a good ballpark for pitching. I think he's also in play if you land on a 6,700 and you're just like, okay, well, let's run it. He's certainly in play in the late slate. I wouldn't neglect that at all. Um, but I think it's probably a, a bit too crazy to get this off the board uh, on the mound with the Dean Kramer targeting the Giants here tonight. Logan Webb on the other side, though, 9,700. Yeah, I think if I had to choose between Logan Webb and Framber Valdez, I'd probably play Logan. Even in a worst matchup um like i said this game's in san francisco it's 55 degrees and baltimore still just an average offense similar to the angels right so 22 percent strikeout rate it's fine whatever 103 wrc plus it's fine whatever 166 iso slightly elevated 32 and a half percent hard contact slightly elevated whatever neutral ground ball to fly ball with some line drives yeah whatever it's it's average um and with one of their best hitters on the dl now in cedric mullins i think that Makes for a very intriguing Logan Webb here. It's 27% aggregate K rate, 70% strike one. Very sustainable for him. Doesn't walk anybody, never has. Very low whip. High strikeout rate, super high ground ball rate, 2.5 to 1 to both sides. Ground ball ratio, I should say. Uh, ground ball to fly ball ratio, I should say. Um, so everything's great here. He's not giving up power. He's got whiffs to both sides. And... I think this is a very playable spot at very playable ownership. 15% for him as well. North 32 in the value score. Um, and I, we're getting what? A nearly two and a half to one ownership discount on web to Framber Valdez, for example, so far. And he'll be less popular than Shohei as well. So I think this is a very playable piece here. If you need to get to kind of a, a late pitcher hammer, I think it's fine. I, put, I think it puts them in play. Um, puts him in play, rather, and the Giants are, are also in play. So I'd mostly just side with uh, a Logan Webb here, but uh, if you want to play some Giants or even some Dean Kramer, like late slate plays, I think this is a, a pretty intriguing tournament game. Uh, okay, I think that's it. Uh, it is. So let's uh, quickly go over you know, a quick review here. St. Louis and Pittsburgh. I'm not playing Flaherty here tonight. I, I think Pittsburgh stacks are, are very much in play. Short stacks probably, hard to get there in this ballpark with them, but it's very warm in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, 90 degrees nearly. Baseball could fly tonight against uh, Jack Flaherty. I like that a, a little bit. And St. Louis, yeah, they're popping pretty good. Top five stack in, in value so far. So you can play them also. Uh, and no Rowenzi for me, even at reduced price tags for both those guys. Philly and Washington. Philly definitely against JoJo. I think this is a, a pretty attackable spot for Philadelphia to kind of get off the schneid a little bit. They're still expensive, though, unfortunately. Uh, and JoJo's been serviceable this season. So it's not like a favorite stack of mine. Uh, even though, like, I'd probably just side with other teams, even though they're 
topping the board in, in value and really in ownership now so far. Uh, but give me a lot of Zach Wheeler for sure. Uh, I, I like the price tag, and I really like the upside in this particular spot for him against Washington. Tampa and Boston. I like Tampa a good bit, too. Correlated stacks with Glass now. Uh, I don't want any Garrett Whitlock. Doesn't have the strikeout stuff. Um, and I'm pretty much off Boston, too. I, I want to get as much Glass now as I can get. Uh, maybe not as much, but certainly some leverage on the field there. Toronto and the Mets. I'm kind of off of Toronto a little bit. I want to play a lot of Justin Verlander. I think he's way underpriced, and I think the metrics right now are depressing his ownership. Um, and, of, of course, we got 17 different arms we can play. And I think the ownership depression is uh, unwarranted. So give me some Verlander. Give me some Mets. And going after Chris Bassett, I think he's got um, – some some real shaky numbers against left-handers here, and a little bit against righties too. Seattle and Texas, I don't really want any Seattle tonight necessarily. Maybe some short stacks or like a Cal Raleigh one-off or something like that. Yeah, sure. But John Gray, I think, is very playable, 7,600. He tore apart this team not just a month ago. Um, I think it's very playable once again. Luis Castillo, sure, he's fine in tournaments because he's got very high upside against a team that will whiff a little bit at an average clip 23%. Uh, but he's probably just going to miss the cut because I like Wheeler a little bit more. But you're not going to get real any real argument from me if you want to play him. Angels, Houston, Shohei and Framber, yeah, definitely. I don't want offense here pretty much at all. If I had to choose, it'd be the Angels, though, because Framber's change-up slider mix has is, is really not been good. Um, so you play Trout, Taylor Ward, something like that. I think that's fine. No Houston, though, for me tonight. Even your, I mean, I have Jordan exposure every day. Uh I don't care if it's against Shohei, but uh, a lot of Shohei for me tonight, I think. Uh, Cleveland and Minnesota, no Savali, I don't think. Um, even, I think he's too expensive, and he doesn't strike anybody out. No Bailey Ober. Eh, maybe some Bailey Ober. I'd like to try and get to some of this, as a matter of fact. Uh, maybe a few twin stacks, but kind of off of offense because they're bad offenses, really. Um, I think Bailey Ober's okay, though. Detroit and, and the White Sox, no Reese Olsen. I want to get to some White Sox against a guy making his debut. This is susceptible... Uh, Battle ball profile down in the minors for him. Mike Levenger, I think he's also in play at 6,600. Not sure if we're going to need it, but uh, I think he's in play coming off of a little bit of wrist inflammation. Detroit is bad, man. Uh, you could also play some Detroit. They're popping very hard in value because they're also so cheap, and Clevenger doesn't strike anybody out. So yeah, go ahead if you want to play a McKinstry, um, Nick Maton, or uh, you know, Torkelson, something like that. Cheap pieces are in play for the Tigers. Akil Badu, he'll be at the top of the lineup. That's fine, too. Uh, but I like the White Sox a good bit. Colorado and Kansas City. I love Colorado here tonight. Um, and it's it's pretty rare that you heard me say that. I really, really like them uh, going after Jordan Lyles. And they're well down the list. They're they're just as cheap as everybody else. And I think they have the best raw matchup here today of anybody. Um, so give me a lot of Colorado. I'm going to have a, a good bit of them here tonight. I'm not going to have any Jordan Lyles, of course. I'll have some Kansas City too, sure, uh, going after Chase Anderson. But the lefties here are probably going to have a pretty hard time. He has a very, very good changeup. I'd probably like to get to Bobby Witt and Salvi a little bit more, to be quite honest. Uh, not not to say that I don't like Vinny. I play him every day. Uh, Atlanta and Arizona, everybody is in play here. I love Merrill Kelly at sub-5% ownership in this particular spot. I think he'd pop for 30 uh, and strike out double digits here tonight. Uh, I think it's very well within range, and I, I, I don't say that all that often for Merrill Kelly. He's got a 28% strikeout rate this season. Uh, but you could play Atlanta, and you could play Arizona. I like Arizona, too, going after Charlie. Um, but Charlie's in play because he's got a very high strikeout rate against lefties. Cubs in San Diego, uh, probably just leaving the Cubs on the shelf here for me tonight. No tie on either. Um, Michael Waka, yeah, maybe. He's seeing a little bit of ownership. I think it's fine, though. Probably a cash play for me a little bit more so than uh, than tournaments. Because there's some variance here with, with Michael Waka that I'm not you know, overly comfortable with him. But I like the Padres, too, going after tie on here. Uh, a little bit also, kind of off the board. Uh, Yankees, Dodgers, I'm probably just going to leave the Yankees on the shelf because I don't like going after Kershaw. But if you want to target it, I mean, it's a fine late slate stack. Yeah, go ahead. Because Kershaw will be like 60% on the late slate or higher. Um, if you want to play Kershaw, yeah, eat 25% ownership on the main slate. Eh, maybe not. we got a lot, a lot of arms we could play. And you can always play the Dodgers. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Baltimore and San Francisco, probably just pitching here for me and mostly just Logan Webb. Not super jacked about playing San Francisco or Baltimore, for that matter, in San Francisco at 50 degrees, but uh, they are in play on the late slate also. Uh, okay, so that's it for the breakdown. Um, 
once again, we'll have uh, ownership and projections updates all throughout the day. Keep an eye out for those guys, and good luck to everybody punting this very large 13-game Friday.